Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Environmental Science Video 17. It's on forestry and rangelands. You might look at a picture like this and say it's wilderness, but it might not be. It might be a privately owned forest, and just like we have farmers on cropland, we might have foresters that are monitoring each of the trees and figuring out when's the best time to harvest these trees. And one technique they use is called clear cutting might look at this and say this is awful it seems like we're destroying the whole forest why would you ever do this well imagine if you own a forest and you're going to harvest the lumber well which, which trees are going to give you the most money it's going to be the largest one so you might just harvest those but now we're faced with another problem we're going to have smaller trees that aren't getting direct sunlight and as all these trees grow up we're going to have that same problem again and so a technique that they'll sometimes use is removing all the trees, we call that clear cutting, and then replanting with what's called a, a tree plantation. So now all the trees are the same age, they're gonna get direct sunlight, and they're gonna be harvested at the same exact time. Now there are some problems with this. So in areas it's gonna promote soil erosion, which could lead to mudslides. We're gonna decrease nutrients in that area, and it's gonna decrease the biodiversity as well. And so what I'm talking about is land management of forests to provide lumber. But I'm I'm also going to talk about land management of rangelands through grazing to produce things like cattle. Both of these resources are renewable. In other words, if we do a good job, they'll keep coming back again, but there are threats to that renewability. So if we're looking at a forest, if you have an old growth forest, those are trees that are really old, sometimes hundreds if not a thousand years old, they're never going to come back in a renewable fashion. We also have forest fires. And then these tree plantations are not threats to the tree plantations themselves but are threats to the biodiversity of our planet. If we're looking at grazing, we could have overgrazing where you're removing the producers. We could have um, deforestation where you cut down the trees to provide for grazing. And these two things together can promote the formation of deserts through desertification. So all of this management could apply to private land, but could also apply to public land. And in the U.S., we have a lot of public forests. Those are generally administered by the U.S. Forest Service. We call those national forests. And then we have a lot of rangelands, federal rangelands and a lot of those in the US are administered by the BLM and so forests provide lumber for us and we have this quaint view of a logger with an axe cutting down a tree like everything it's been highly industrialized this is a sawmill it's feeding uh, the wood through and we're using lasers to get the optimum amount of lumber out Techniques they use are clear cutting, where we can remove all of the trees, replant it with a tree plantation, and then we can do selective cutting. And so when we're removing just specific pines, that's gonna cost more money, but may be healthier for the forest. But not only do forests provide lumber, they provide an area for recreation, they reduce erosion, they're carbon sinks, so through photosynthesis, they can take in a lot of carbon dioxide, and also they promote the biodiversity, the ecological services on our planet. What are some threats to all of those? Well, if we harvest old growth trees, so these are things like redwood trees, um, big spruces in British Columbia that have taken hundreds of years to grow, once you remove them, then they're gone forever. They're not going to have time to grow back. And if you look in North America, 90% of our old growth has already been harvested. So the, the deed has already been done. Forest fires are another threat. And so on the east coast of the U.S., we don't have really uh, that many forest fires. It's because we have a lot of rain. But as people move west, they saw these giant forest fires. They're a natural part of forest ecosystems, but big fires, like in 1910, they called it the big blow up, killed a number of people. And so it led to fire suppression. I grew up with Smokey the Bear telling you, you can prevent forest fires. And a lot of this fire suppression led to more fuels. And so in 1988, I can remember the giant fires in Yellowstone National Park. And so we have to adopt a more sustainable way of, of managing fires. Prescribed burns in certain areas to remove some of the undergrowth is an example of that. Now tree plantations, and you know it's a tree plantation because you see all these trees just planted in straight rows, are a great way to harvest lumber, but are not great for the biodiversity of the forest. And a lot of the forests are owned by us. They're public forests. So if we look at the U.S. Forest Service, in certain states, especially those out west, it's a high percentage of the land that is in these national forests. And so their goal is to not only protect that lumber, but also protect recreation and biodiversity in that area. Now, are they doing a good job with that? Some people would say they're they're doing all three, but maybe in that order, that they don't have an emphasis on protecting the biodiversity of the forest. As we move on to rangelands, a common idea is this 
tragedy of the commons. It was put forth by ecologist Garrett Hardin, and it goes like this. It's this imaginary situation. Imagine we have two ranchers, they have a bunch of cows, and there's a public area next to them. We'll call it a commons. No one owns it, it's owned by everyone. So one of the ranchers will put a cow out there, and let's say this has a carrying capacity of four cows. Only four cows can live on this area. Well, another rancher might put a cow out, and he'll do the same, and he'll double it, and then all of a sudden we have too many cows on the commons. We have overgrazing and now it's bad for everybody. So how do we solve the problem? Well, one way to solve it is to give them ownership. If they each own a portion of that land, they're not going to overgraze it because they want it to be productive into the future, so they would only put two cows on each one. Or the government could come in and say, we've got limits, so each of you, two ranchers, are limited to two cows on that area. And so let's see how that's played out in the U.S. So range lines are areas where we can graze cattle, sheep, things like that. And generally they're areas where we can't necessarily necessarily grow a lot of crops and so we're able to harvest energy from that area. If we graze too much we have overgrazing, we're depleting the producers, and a lot of those times they won't come back. We can also have deforestation. So this is not in the US, but if we're looking down in Brazil, this is deforestation in the Amazon. We're cutting down trees. Now a lot of those soils can't grow crops, and so what happens, about 90% of the deforestation in Brazil leads to cattle grazing on that area. And if we have a combination of these two things, overgrazing, deforestation, it can lead to desertification. This is the Gobi Desert, and you can see that it's growing Growing and it's hard once a desert is formed we can't go back to having those soils again so let's see how this played out in the US so we used to have what was called uh, open range and so anybody could graze their cattle on it they would use brands to figure out which was their own cattle but over time tragedy of the commons brought forth this idea of overgrazing that combined with big uh, winters this is a picture of uh, Charlie Russell of the winter of 1886 so so many of those cattle died we also had the advent of barbed wire so we partitioned certain areas out. And so in 1934, the Taylor Grazing Act was put forward, signed into, at, into law by Roosevelt, and it established these areas, especially out west, where you could graze. You could get a permit, and then you could graze your cattle on that area, but they could put limits to that grazing. That eventually folded into the BLM, and if we look at how much rangeland we have in the U.S., it's going to be this light yellow area. It's large portions of the U.S., and so you're buying a permit, and you can graze your cattle there, and also on U.S. Forest Service land as well. Now, what are some problems with that the fees don't make up for how much it costs to administer this land and so in 2006 I think it was seven times the amount of money to run the BLM as they were getting from these uh, these grazing fees and so some people say those fees are, are too low and also they're protecting the grazing land but aren't protecting the biodiversity of the environment and so if we revisit that idea of the tragedy of the commons with these two imaginary ranchers in this common area you can see that private ownership is one way to solve it government Government intervention is another way to solve it, but Eleanor Ostrom, an, ec an economist who won the Nobel Prize, said this is all imaginary. These are imaginary ranchers that can't talk to each other. And if you look out in the world, there are lots of areas where we're sharing a commons. The Maasai of, of Africa are a great example of that where they're able to graze their cattle and do that sustainably. And that brought forth this idea of Ostrom's Law, a resource arrangement that's working in practice can work in theory. And it allows us to take a, a better look at this whole idea of the tragedy of the commons. So did you learn the following? Could you pause the video at this point and fill in all the blanks? Let me do it for you. Land management of forests for lumber and range lands for things like cattle. Um, it should be renewable. The threats to that are old growth forests, forest fires, tree plantations. Remember, overgrazing deforestation can lead to desertification. A lot of this is private, but we also have public ownership. U.S. Forest Service of the National Forest. And then we have these federal range lands that are administered by the BLM. And I hope that was helpful.